since without this stronger principle, we wouldn't make it to belief in God's actual existence as the guarantor of this real possibility. Instead, we would arrive at the conclusion that for all we justifiably believe God exists, not something that would have made Kant satisfied. The discussion of hope in the religion book is more prominent than it is in the critique and more complex than that in the critique. Although the details of the moral proof have changed by this time, the, moral condi the modal condition on rational hope has, as far as I can see, not changed. The most prominent and frequent use of hope in religion is as an attitude that we can reasonably take towards a version of the doctrine of divine grace. Kant's self-professed rigorism in ethics says that a free agent is always either oriented towards the bad and thus radically evil, or towards the good. There's no room for a kind of middle indifferentist, meliorist position in Kant. In part one of the religion, moreover, Kant argues that we all innately possess, sort of infamously argues that we innately possess a radically evil propensity for which we are also somehow responsible. Um, big mysterious doctrine that I won't address. Um, we are innately possessed of a propensity for which we are also somehow responsible. Our task as ethical agents is to perform what he calls the revolution of the will that makes us fundamentally good once again. All the same, throughout religion, Kant says that we may and even must hope that God will assist us in this task. Here's just one representative passage. This is number two. Reason says that whoever does in a disposition of true devotion to duty, as much as lies within his power to satisfy his obligation, at least in a steady approximation towards complete conformity to the law, can rationally or legitimately hope that what lies outside his power will be supplemented by the supreme wisdom in some way or other, which can render permanent the disposition to the steady approximation, without reason thereby presuming to determine that way or know in what it consists, of course. For God's way can perhaps be so mysterious that at best he could reveal it to us in a symbolic representation in which the practical import alone is comprehensible to us, so maybe something like a scripture or a piece of art. Whereas theoretically we could not in the least grasp what this relation of God to the human being is in itself or attach concepts to it, even if God wanted to reveal such a mystery to us. Various critics, and this is kind of one of the main topics in Kant's philosophy of religion, various critics, including people like um, Gordon Michelson, John Hare, Nicholas Waltersdorf, and Philip Quinn, highlight the clear tensions between passages like this, which claim that if we've done our moral best, then we can, quote, rationally hope for divine assistance, and two other basic Kantian commitments. The first is ought implies can. If we ought to be perfectly good, then Kant thinks we can be perfectly good, says this repeatedly. Grace, special divine assistance to get us to a place where we ought to be, thus can't be required. But on the other hand, Kant says regarding the will to the good that the human being in his natural corruption cannot bring it about on his own within himself. So there's this tension between claims about ought implies can and about our own responsibilities in becoming moral once again and the claims about the necessity of grace. Second and more pressingly, Michelson, Quinn, and company read Kant as committed to what they call a stoic, the stoic maxim according to which each individual is fully responsible for his or her own moral condition. This is quotation three. Man himself must have made himself into whatever in a moral sense, whether good or evil, he is or is to become. This again is obviously in tension with the claim that divine assistance is in any way involved in our transition to a good will. If supernatural external help is involved, even if, it is, if that involvement is not required, then it seems that we're not making ourselves what we morally ought to be. Many of the critics, these, they, they're now called in the literature conundrum theorists, um, leave the discussion there at these conundrums, arguing that Kant fails to steer us adequately through the moral gap 
between the Pelagian Scylla and the Augustinian Charybdis. John Hare sums up the situation this way, this is quotation four, what Kant has to do is to show that the revolution, the revolution of the will, is possible, and he does this by pointing to the possibility of supernatural assistance. His failure, however, is to show how he can appeal to such assistance given the rest of his theory, and in particular given the Stoic maxim. He has to show, we might say, not how supernatural assistance is possible, but that he can appeal to it given the rest of his theory. This is what he fails to do. I want to suggest, by contrast, that a possible solution to the whole conundrum regarding grace comes into view when we consider that what Kant is recommending regarding this doctrine, as he says repeatedly in the religion and other places, is neither knowledge nor belief, but rather hope. As we've seen, hope can be rational even where knowledge or belief in the Kantian sense are not. A subject does not have to show or prove that a state of affairs is really possible in order rationally to hope for it. Only knowledge requires the proof of real possibility. Indeed, the subject doesn't even need practical grounds for belief that grace is actual. Rather, in accordance with principle H, it simply needs to be the case that for all the subject is justified in believing, the state of affairs is really possible. Alternatively, and this is Kant's stronger formulation in H star, she simply needs to believe on rational but non-epistemic, kind of broadly practical grounds that the state of affairs is really possible. Both of these are quite a bit weaker than what Hare seems to suggest Kant is required to do, namely that he somehow show that divine assistance is possible before asking us to hope for it. But can even these weaker conditions be met in the case of something as obscure as divine grace? Kant seems to think so. It is incomprehensible, as he puts it in the um, passage just quoted, whether and how the combination of human effort and divine assistance may obtain. But by the same token, we also do not know that the grace is metaphysically impossible. As long as that is so, we can believe that it is really possible on practical, non-epistemic grounds, and then hope that it is actual. Quotation five, to believe that grace may have its effects, and that perhaps there may be such effects to supplement the imperfection of our striving for virtue is all that we can say on the subject. Whichever condition on rational hope we accept then, either H or H star, the claim that full human agency and divine assistance work together to make us righteous is one that we can rationally hope to be true. Here I think the conundrum theorists will cry out. Wasn't the source of the conundrum the fact that we take ourselves to know or at least have very good reason to believe that the following is an incompatible triad? Take S or let S stand for any radically evil agent. Um, proposition A, S ought to make himself righteous. That is, he ought to convert the maxim of his will. B, S can make himself righteous. C, S requires God's assistance in becoming righteous. Kant can't reject A, given his overall ethical theory, and he can't retain A and reject B without violating ought implies can. So, says the conundrumist, he is forced either to deny C or to deny the stoic maxim according to which, if an agent is morally responsible for the quality of her will, then she must be solely causally responsible for it as well. In other words, he will have to deny the claim that it is impossible for one person to make himself righteous and thus worthy of happiness, and yet for another person to provide assistance. This, I think, is the heart of the conundrum. But putting it in such a stark form also makes it clear that Kant may have a way out. For even if we accept ought implies can, and thus the inference from A to B, the incompatibility of B and C is not obviously a function of logical inconsistency, despite the surface grammar. We simply don't know enough about how kind of relations of dependence 
in substances at the intelligible or noumenal level work to know that my being fully responsible for my moral character precludes in some way uh, metaphysically God's also being at least partly responsible for it. Seems much more plausible that the situation here is, as Kant says, incomprehensible or inscrutable. Or that B and C can be known to be, at most, noumenally, causally incompatible, um, rather than kind of noumenally, metaphysically incompatible. So this is the kind of bizarre move at the end that I'll um, say something about now. What would justify someone in thinking that one state of affairs, now let's talk about noumenal causal incompatibility or noumenal causal relations, the relations of dependence and, and um, kind of affection in the noumenal world as, for lack of a better term, nozzle uh, incompatibility and compatibility. So noumenal <coughs> causal, nozzle. Uh, I really need a different term, but. Um, <laughs> What would justify you in thinking that one state of affairs is nausily incompatible with another? Presumably, the conclusion here is drawn by extrapolation from beliefs about how joint causal effects are produced in the empirical world. We typically think that if cause C is fully responsible for some effect E, then some other event is not at all responsible for E. The extrapolated idea, then, is that in the realm of free intelligible acts, it is likewise impossible for one agent to be fully nausily responsible for something while also requiring the assistance of some other agent to accomplish it. One way to counter this claim about nozzle impossibility is to say that, for all we know, a version of theological compatibilism is, at the noumenal level might also be palatable. Perhaps we can fully be fully responsible even while God is also partly or fully responsible. Unfortunately, it's pretty clear that while Kant is a compatibilist about noumenal freedom and phenomenal determination, he wants to keep straightforward compatibilism, theological as well as scientific, out of the story about fundamental free actions. A second response might try to divide the labor in a kind of Anselmian fashion, arguing that for Kant, we simply have to stop resisting grace and allow God to make the requisite change in the maxim of our wills. Although Kant says things in places that suggest this kind of picture, and places in the religion as well as elsewhere, in general, it doesn't seem to do much to resolve the tension with the Stoic maxim, I think. We're supposed to be fully causally responsible for our kind of moral improvements. Not just stop resisting, but somehow be involved in the um, improvements themselves. A third response would revert to the fact that this is, after all, the noumenal level, and so we can't know that something like grace is impossible unless we can spy a genuine logical or conceptual impossibility. And again, most of Kant's language in religion and the lectures suggests that pointing this out is his strategy for avoiding the conundrum. He thinks it is simply inscrutable to us how grace might work at the noumenal level, and thus the weaker modal condition on hope that P be metaphysically possible for all S justifiably believes is satisfied. But since Kant elsewhere seems to back the stronger modal condition, H star, according to which S must at least have a rational belief that P is metaphysically possible, it's worth discussing whether this condition, too, can be met in this context. So fourth, so I've given you three strategies that you might take to try to avoid um, the conundrum. The fourth and strangest one is this. Let's su suppose that the situation we're imagining, that we are fully responsible for our own righteousness and that God is also fully or at least partly responsible, is, in fact, impossible in this nozzle, noumenal causal sense. And let's suppose further that we know or have reason to believe that this is so. I take it that's what the conundrum theorists think they have. Even so, I submit, this still doesn't affect Kant's claim about the rationality of hope. After all, what we have here is just a nozzle impossibility, one that is, for all we know, still absolutely really possible. <clears throat> 
What does that mean? Well, just as it is rational, for a theist anyway, to hope for an empirical miracle, even though 